Hello and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Love Potion number nine, number 10. Trouble in the dating world? Oxytocin is a naturally occurring hormone that is strongly linked to facilitating human bonding and relationships, dubbed the cuddle or love hormone by popular press. Uh, it has recently even earned attention for its role in promoting trust. So rather than struggle through the dating scene unjuiced, try Love Potion number 10. Our unique chemical formula is the strongest, most effective, and enhanced version of the hormone. So hold your nose, close your eyes, and take a drink of Love Potion number 10. 9. 10. 10. No, it's 10, not 9. It's 10 because it's better. It's not number 9, it's number 10, and it's based on science. Love Potion number 10. While that song may not have been written with the purpose of describing love in the brain, it appears that Hadaway wasn't far off. Love is addictive, love is obsessive, love is prone to poor decision making, and love seems to come down to a particular mix of chemicals in your brain. While it seems odd to pull love out of the heart and put it in the brain, recent research from neuroscience is indicating the brain is playing an integral role in different types of love. Today I speak with Allie Gibbons about how the brain changes as you fall, as you fall both into and out of love. The sun is gone from the sky. From this too, I will emerge. So thanks for coming in. I'm here with Allie Gibbons, and we're talking about love in the brain. Uh, hopefully, an interesting topic, especially for college students. All right, so can you tell me uh, how you got interested in? Uh, love and the brain? Um, well, actually, right when we were choosing topics, I saw a poster in my dorm that was a speaker actually speaking like, on this topic. Um, so I went to the speaker, and I found like it was like a really, really interesting uh, topic, and I wanted to look more into it. I also, I just find it to be a very interesting topic, um, especially here. I feel like there's a lot of like new couples that you're seeing, uh, especially your first year, and it's just interesting for me to find out how to what's happening in the brain for those people. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, thinking back to my first year, that uh, people who were like staying together with their high school sweethearts, mm -hmm. uh, and then you kind of saw some fall off at fall break, you yeah. know, like when they went home and broke up with their <laughs> high school yeah. uh, sweethearts, uh, and then a lot at uh, Thanksgiving time. Yeah, uh, no, and, definitely. And then you kind of see the relationship starting just before finals, Yeah. and uh, <laughs> kind of at the end of the first semester is like that six month uh, critical period. Yeah. And so I think it'll be interesting to see in a, a month or so here how many of those new couples are yeah. still new. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like going into the summer, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and because you're here, you have so much time with the uh, the people that you're around, and then all of a sudden people are off yeah. somewhere yeah. else. Uh, so what sorts of things are going on in the brain uh, in these uh, new, new lovers? Um, one thing that I found most interesting was that there was like deactivation or like less activity in the amygdala and in the prefrontal cortex. Um, both of which, like, a combination of the two is correlated with, like, more recklessness. Um, so I related it in my uh, midterm project to, like, the song Crazy in Love, yeah. which, like, is actually true when you look at, like, the areas of the brain that are active versus not active. So I, th I thought that was, like, the most interesting part of my research. Um, and that's mostly what I looked at was, like, the areas of the brain that are active and that are not mm -hmm. active. Uh, with like MRI studies and stuff like that. So. Yeah, were there other areas of the brain that actually were more active uh, for these uh, new couples? Um, I think that, yeah, there definitely were. There was a lot of the um, like connections between different areas of the brain were more active. And like when you look at like, just like images of the brain, there's definitely more activity in the brain um, overall, um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. And more activity in like the areas that produce hormones like oxytocin mm -hmm. and vasopressin um which i found interesting like specifically like the cells that are responsible for producing those yeah Just, like an increased like sense of happiness and stuff like that yeah so the people uh, kind of falling in love uh, it was a it's a combination of deactivation of certain areas uh, the <laughs> reckless uh, yeah. decision making areas but then also an increase in the production of different hormones yeah uh, and is it uh, that balance between the deactivation and the uh, activation of these hormones, is that able to predict who's going to fall in love or stay in love? 
I yeah, I definitely think so. I think that when most of the studies were like people that were like claimed to be in love were shown pictures of like people that they were at their like significant other. Mm-hmm. Um and so yeah, I think like those people when they like saw pictures of like friends versus someone that they were claimed to be in love with were more active in like different areas of the brain. Um which was interesting too because I like, I didn't necessarily focus on this but it got into like aspects of like what parts of the brain are active with like different types of love. So like Okay when you see, like, your parents versus when you see, like, a friend versus when you see, like, a significant other. Um, I didn't focus on that, so I don't know, like, the exact parts of the brain, but, Mm -hmm. like, there were different areas of the brain that were active for, like, different, like, types of love. Yeah, I think I remember something talking about that in intro, uh, like, the difference between romantic love, kind of familial love, and then lust. Yeah. And uh, I remember in particular for lust, uh, there was, like, more... uh, visual uh, cortices yeah, that yeah, have been yeah. involved because like it was like the imagination of that person and I, I think I can't remember the celebrity that they used for that uh, particular example but yeah uh, and I know that a lot of like the areas of the brain that are were active when they saw a picture of their loved one were also act like are also areas that are correlated with drug addiction mm-hmm. um and like an increased activity during drug addiction so I did talk about like in my midterm project how like similar being how like love is like addictive mm-hmm. just like the drugs are. Yeah, and that's so then going to the other side of love, breaking up with someone is kind of yeah. like losing your fix or yeah. losing the thing that you're addicted to. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, have you, you've been looking at kind of the happy side of the front end of, of yeah. relationships, not yeah. the back end. Uh, do you think that there's uh, something that's confusing about uh, understanding how the brain is involved in love? Um, I think that for me, the hardest part for this project specifically was like taking all the different studies and like they're just I think confusing in their wording and mm-hmm. in like certain areas of the brain that are like kind of like you don't hear as much about and like translating that into language that like first of all I understood and then yeah. second like other people would understand and like doing that and making it interesting at the same time yeah so yeah I don't know if that got to your question but no yeah I think so so you were just talking about your BuzzFeed listicle, the neuroscience, what neuroscience says, seven things that happen in your brain when you fall in love. Mm -hmm. Uh, What has been the uh, response that you've had from friends or family about that? Um, actually the other day, like two nights ago, one of my friends found this article, um, and she like shared it on Facebook and I got like, I've gotten a lot of people have texted me and like said stuff to me about it and that they found it like really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so my mom saw it and she shared it and like, yeah, I just got a very positive response from it. Yeah. So yeah, I was really happy with that. People say that they're learning something? Yeah. They said it was like very interesting too. Yeah. Which I was, I thought that was like one of the aspects that like could be challenging was to make it like understandable and interesting. Right. Yeah. Because there is a lot of confusing things. So you talk about oxytocin, yeah. dopamine, uh, amygdala, yeah. prefrontal cortex, and there's all this kind of jargon. Mm-hmm. And jargon is, seems like the opposite of like something yeah. that's interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. And especially with love. Um, so, uh, thinking about uh, the, the public response, uh, do you think that there's any like one really important thing that uh, you want to mention or communicate about uh, your topic? I think that what, like, most simply, I would say would be that there's definitely something that happens in your brain when you do fall in love, and like, that's what. I really started to get interested in, like, looking into about the topic was, like, is there actually something that is happening? Um, and yeah, so, like, there is. So I think that's, like, most simply what I would say is that there's definitely, like, the brain is a large part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so do you think that we could take this kind of information and help people with relationships? I think, yeah, I mean, one of my friends, after she read the article, was like, if I ever get a boyfriend, can you, like, take an FR, like an fMRI of my brain and tell me if I'm in love with them? So, I think, like, yes. And mm-hmm. also, I did look at the effects that, like, what happens to the brain when, you are, when you're dumped. Um, okay. It was actually a pretty sad reality. It was, like, the areas of the brain that are active when you're in love actually become more active after, like, you've just recently broken up with someone. Um, so, it was, like, the opposite of what you want to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think you could take that information and go somewhere with it. And also just, like, the like the addictive aspect of it. Yeah. I don't necessarily know what you could change about that, but I think it's all interesting to consider. Yeah, that's interesting. And that helps me kind of understand breaking up with someone and then getting back together. Yeah, your yeah. Your brain is becoming more active yeah, right yeah. after you get dumped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, had, I didn't know about that, so that's interesting to reflect back on. <laughs> uh, and 
let's see, I, I thought I had another question. Oh, like, do you think, so we could use this information for, like, dating apps? So um, I have people pay money to come in and, like, be a part of my, like, dating app or whatever. Yeah. People go on dates for a little bit to maybe try the relationship three or four months, and then, like, they also pay for an fMRI and, and see how their brain reacts? Yeah. Or do you think that some people are just kind of different and their brain's not showing the love signal? Mm. I think you could definitely use it to promote a dating app and like in terms of I think the general public will be more likely to like use an app that's so like scientifically backed up in a mm -hmm. sense and also yeah like the idea that you can look at your brain and like see if you actually are in love with someone and if you should stay with them versus like maybe you're not and like you're like fooling yourself into thinking that you are so you could use it in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And then thinking of uh, how the brain is different across different types of love do you think that there is a shift uh, within like kind of a romantic partner away from that lust to uh, like a, a deeper level of love um i mean there definitely was and i did look at like one article that showed that you could like be in lust with someone and be in love with someone else oh okay. which i found was interesting it's like the bachelor yeah <laughs> so like yeah it, it, like very much is um so yeah i think there's like different activity that's correlated like there's different parts of the brain that's correlated with lust and that's correlated with like love like deep mm -hmm. romantic love um and like i guess sometimes you have both like that towards like the same person like maybe it'll be towards two different people mm -hmm. but i found like i found that to be very interesting yeah that there was two parts of that. yeah yeah that is um, another thing that i hadn't really thought much about uh so i think as we kind of wrap uh, wrap this up here um not too much it's it's area that's under development it sounds like yeah uh, and uh, kind of a, a lot of open questions do you think so you mentioned the uh, drug oxytocin uh, do you think oxytocin could be like a love chemical that's used in colognes or something like that yeah I don't know I haven't really considered that but I mean yeah they call I, a lot of the articles I was reading was like called oxytocin like the love hormone mm -hmm. um so yeah I think it could <laughs> all right uh, and so I think we talked just before we started recording here. Uh, anything you'd like to promote? Um, Women's Lacrosse has their second conference game this Saturday at 1 p.m. on campus. So. Swanfield? Yes, Swanfield. All right. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to come in. I really appreciate it. I can't see it just yet. It's not dead, just a little afraid of the dark. So thanks so much for, to Allie for coming in and speaking about uh, love in the brain. That's such an interesting topic and, and lots of different uh, kind of avenues of research uh, and different ways that we're going. Uh, seeing so many different parts of the brain being involved, uh, different types of chemicals uh, from hormones like oxytocin, vasopressin, uh, things like pheromones that uh, seem to almost play a magical role or at least a poorly understood role in humans. Uh, to other uh, hormones like testosterone and estrogen, uh, and then going uh, over into the neurochemical uh, side, looking at dopamine, epinephrine, serotonin, uh, maybe even something like nerve growth factor. Uh, so how confusing it is to look at uh, this kind of mix of chemicals uh, at the hormonal and neurochemical level, uh, and then all the different parts of the brain, uh, so the prefrontal cortex, amygdala, hippocampus, uh, the reward pathways, uh, such a confusing area, uh, but uh, so fascinating to see how the, br the brain is changing in different types of love. Uh, so uh, one of the more fascinating things that I think Ali brought up was uh, the idea that uh, you, have, you could have lust uh, as one type of love and uh, kind of a ro more romantic love and feel those towards maybe the same or uh, different people. Uh, turning to the uh, last uh, two segments of the show, uh, Jake's Jams, uh, the part of the show where I talk about uh, something uh, I've been interested in lately. Uh, I'm kind of running out of things since I've, I've been doing this so uh, close back to back. Uh, the other day I mentioned Amazon Prime, and uh, one of the uh, shows I've been watching uh, more recently uh, has been um, The Americans, uh, which is an interesting show from the 1980s about Russian spies. Uh, previously, the, one of the producers of that show had uh, produced the show Justified, another one I'd recommend. Uh, so not, nothing too scientific, nothing too helpful, uh, but uh, two interesting shows that I've uh, been enjoying. Uh, and then uh, reader mail or mailbag, Twitter tweets, uh, nothing again so far. Uh, there, I should note that uh, uh, the podcast channel has gone over 100 views with uh, 11 or so episodes that have been up so far. So having some views, uh, I'd probably say that I'm at least 10 of those uh, as I watch it once to put one view on. 
uh, every uh, episode that I put up. Uh, so maybe we'll say 90 so far, uh, but uh, hopefully soon over 100 actual people or people other than me. Uh, so uh, you can uh, reach me with any questions or suggestions uh, at uh, Engage Brain on Twitter, or you can email me at my last name at gmail.com uh, if you have any questions or uh, any suggestions. So uh, we'll sign off here. Uh, this has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.